Hi, and welcome to our session in Edin U.S. on diversity, which uh, asks you to think about multicultural education and special education. Uh, I'm going to do a, a quick lecture on the history of diversity education in the United States. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go to the discussion boards after watching a very brief video uh, here on, on the lecture, and I'll give you the web link, web link if the video doesn't play well here. Um, so you can go and, and watch that directly on your, your PC uh, if that's better. But I'm going to ask you to respond to a prompt that relates to, to the situation that you're going to see a video on. Uh, there's also a brief discussion on technology in the classroom. And uh, Essential Question 3 coincides with, with this week's information and readings. Okay, so uh, we've already covered a bit of uh, the history of special education, our third lecture on the history of education in the U.S., so I'm not really going to talk about the history of that because we've, we've kind of covered that, but I did want to delve a bit into the origins of multicultural education. Um, it begins really with John Dewey and the progressives. Uh, the progressives, as you may recall, called for education that responded to the needs of all students. Uh, I, I mentioned this in the lecture on John Dewey and the progressives that... Um, Though Dewey himself was a founding member of the NAACP, and so therefore uh, fairly progressive when it comes to issues of race and inequality, he, in his work, in his official publications and writing, actually speaks very little about the topic. Um, there's hints at it, uh, there's nods to it, but it's not something he ever fully uh, comes to terms with in his own writing. And this is one of the major uh, criticisms, historically, of the progressives of the, of the turn of the century in the early 20th century, uh, is that they really, they, they sort of lay the philosophical groundwork for discussions around multicultural education, but they themselves, though aware of the problems, aware of the contradictions between democratic education and separate but clearly unequal education, uh, do little to, to work against that. It's really early African American scholars, uh, such as G. Carter Woodson, who is pictured here, uh, who begin this work. That, that later becomes multicultural education. Um, so W.E.B. Du Bois, who we've talked about, George Washington Carver, and G. Carter Woodson um, are kind of the main three writers, philosophers, historians, who really pick apart the uh, prevailing views of African Americans in schools. So they look at the curriculum, especially in the social studies and in history courses, and say, well, where's African American history in this? Where's, where's this you know, these groups that are traditionally underrepresented, why are they underrepresented? And, and how might this schooling then be negatively impacting African American students and Caucasian students or students of all races? Okay, how does this, this education that sort of really only focuses on one group and privileges one group, how does that impact everybody? Not just the underprivileged, but the privileged as well. Okay, and so if, if, if you become a social studies teacher, you are a social studies teacher, and you're active in the National Council for the Social Studies every year, they give out a G. Carter Woodson Book Award um, in honor of G. Carter Woodson, um, which gives you a sense for just how important his research and his writing was. Okay, Now, in the 1920s and the 1940s, uh, you have something called the Intercultural Education Movement. And you may recall from the lecture in the third session that there's this uh, intense wave of immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe uh, from around 1900 and 1920. Now, the, the government puts a a clamp down on it in 1924 with the Johnson Reed Act. Um, but during that time, there's these groups of immigrants that come in that are speaking languages that are not Germanic and not Romance languages, or, or sometimes Romance languages, but they're unfamiliar, right? They're not Germanic. They're not um, you know, Anglo-Saxons. They're not Protestants. And so there's this uh, diversity concern in the schools. Uh, and schools really fail to account for the diversity that these new ways of immigrants brought with them. Um, immigrants... Uh, there was Russian Orthodox and Russian Jews, Catholics um, from Southeastern Europe and from Poland. And so there was this failed process of Americanization in schools. Schools didn't really uh, consider that these new groups of students would need um, unique or um, a diverse curriculum to respond to um, their language barriers or cultural barriers. So Rachel Dubois uh, was a radical teacher who hoped to educate students to appreciate this diversity. Okay, and she taught the first intercultural course at, at Boston University. Now, an intercultural education really exists at the collegiate level at this time. And it runs through about the 1940s. And it's in the 1940s that a shift occurs. Okay, the intercultural education movement begins to fade. 
And the second Great Migration North, we talked about um, the two waves of migration, African Americans during World War I, immediately after, and then during World War II, uh, moving north, right? There was job opportunities in industry, a chance to escape uh, the, the predominantly uh, sharecropping and unequal um, economy of the South. Um, they all moved north. Um, and so as European ethnic minorities begin to integrate into U.S. society, this inequality between blacks and whites spurs the need for a rethinking of American education. So it's a shift in focus from how do we integrate immigrants to how do we educate diverse students, ethnically speaking, particularly looking at African Americans. The leaders of this movement believed it was the educator's job to assist students in reducing prejudice by infusing perspectives from different cultures into the classroom. So kind of the vision put out by W.E.B. Du Bois and G. Carter Woodson is put into practice. There's 4,000 programs. Sounds like a lot, but it's really not that much. Um, these programs really only exist in New York City and in Chicago. And it's at this point that multicultural education, as we have come to know it today, begins to take hold. So this is really deeply connected to the civil rights movement. Um, now, there's always been a movement for civil rights. It's wrong to say it started with Brown versus Board. Um, but certainly, legislative victories begin in 1954 after the Brown versus Board decision. Okay, so this is tied to the, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. So Brown versus Board, and there you are, you're looking at uh, young Linda Brown and her mother sitting on the steps of the Supreme Court celebrating uh, the ban on segregation in public schools. This decision opens the door for voices that have been excluded from school-wide decision-making. Okay, when schools are, are desegregated, African-American parents and community leaders called for curricula that represented their histories. Now, one interesting side note to this that's often not talked about is that there were all-black schools prior to the Brown decision that thrived, uh, especially in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And um, in these schools, you know, you had African-American administrators, African-American teachers. Um, you had sports teams that were successful. You had mascots. You had cultures that developed around um, the African-American school experience. Now, those schools were the exception. Most schools fit under the separate but unequal uh, paradigm. But one thing to note is that when desegregation took place, those schools were also forced to desegregate. And so there was a loss for a lot of communities of their own autonomy. They got mm -hmm. sort of absorbed by, um, by the white school power structure. Um, but, but what's important to note about this period is that uh, it calls for a rethinking of equality within institutions or a demand for equality within institutions. But the locus of that is in the schools. This is where it begins. And larger societal changes propelled further calls for traditional curricula to be rev revised. Okay, hitherto, minority cultures were considered deficient. Right? They weren't part of the curriculum because they weren't important enough to be in the curriculum. They weren't advanced enough to be in the curriculum. Uh, and, and so the civil rights movement forces a rethinking of this dominant prejudice. Now, we know it still exists today, uh, but the, the, the rethinking of it begins here within the schools themselves. In the 1960s and the 1970s, you have the ethnic studies movement. Right? Non-European students begin to call for more accurate portrayals of their histories in textbooks. Um, so you hear voices of African Americans, Chicanos, Latinos, and Native Americans. They're all at the heart of this movement. And so courses are developed uh, that are specific to non-European ethnic groups. Again, a lot of this happens at the collegiate level, but it does happen at high school levels. And we're going we're gonna to look at one example of a controversial ethnic studies uh, course. Simultaneous to this, you also have the women's rights movement, also in the 1960s and 1970s. Women joined the push for educational reform by challenging inequalities in, in employment and education as well as income. They accused schools of pushing systematic uh, sexism, and they noted the low number of female administrators. Um, so you might recall that the, the logic of co-education of boys learning with girls has, has never been fundamentally challenged, but there have been groups that have sought to uh, create separate curricula that are designed specifically for girls, home economics, typing classes, and, and things like that. Um, so these groups, these voices began to push for curricula that were more inclusive of their histories. And it's in the 1980s that the what would be called the multicultural education movement um, begins. James Banks, who, who you're reading for this session, was the first scholar to examine schools from a multicultural perspective. 
uh, perspective. And according to Banks, multicultural education, quote, is not an ethnic or gender specific movement, but is a movement designed to empower all students to become knowledgeable, caring, and active citizens in a deeply troubled and ethnically polarized nation. He goes on to say that in order to maintain a multicultural school environment, all aspects of the school have to be examined and transformed, including policies, teachers' attitudes, instructional materials, assessment methods, counseling, and teaching styles. So you see why sometimes the holidays perspective that, uh, you know, for example, February is um, Black History Month or, you know, Kwanzaa will be recognized alongside Christmas and Hanukkah. That's not enough for multicultural theorists. That the whole curriculum, the whole school environment has to be transformed if it's going to be multicultural. It's not just add a dash of this here and a dab of that there. It's let's rethink the knowledge that we're presenting to students and the way we're presenting it and the institutions in which we present it. So as the 1980s flowed into the final decade of the 20th century, multicultural education scholars refocused the struggle on developing new approaches and models of education and learning built on a foundation of social justice, critical thinking, and equal opportunity. More recently, heteronormativity in schools has been challenged by multicultural scholars. But, you know, multicultural education, though, you know, here at Sacred Heart, you'll take a course on diversity in education, is not universally loved. Um, there are voices in American society that criticize multicultural education. So I, I want to unfold those or unpack those right now. Um, some folks have said that, uh, this, that this approach to education undermines national unity. This is a particular criticism of ethnic studies courses. If we focus on what makes us different as opposed to what makes us you know, similar, then you know, people form into these ethnic groups and they, they don't communicate with people that aren't from those ethnic groups and so on. Um, others have argued that it's a particularly anti-Western ideology. So Samuel Huntington um, was a writer who, uh, or is a writer, political th scientist, who was writing after the fall of the Soviet Union and was looking at a world where America was the only superpower and was worried that America didn't have an external enemy. And as a result, the internal differences among the ethnic groups of, the Amer of Americans would become sort of a civil um, disengagement. There'd be a civil disengagement as a result. So he, he argues that multiculturalism, quote, had attacked the identification of the United States with Western civilization, denied the existence of a common American culture, and promoted racial, ethnic, and other subnational cultural identities and groupings. Others have noted that this is an assault on Anglo-American heritage. Right? Again, going along with that previous argument, it undermines America's common culture and its connection to um, English history. It threatens to balkanize the nation. And that it's antithetical to democracy. That multiculturalism can only exist in a totalitarian government where the government is never um, decided upon by the people, right? So if the government is always stable and tells you exactly what to do, well, then we can think about the differences among the people because we always have that common government to go back to. Now, these arguments probably sound like they're politically conservative, and they all are, but it's not just p folks on the political right who have issues with multicultural education, though it's considered a liberal or a progressive philosophy, um, there are, there are uh, folks who have argued that it prevents unity in movements for social justice. So some feminists, for example, have argued that uh, women's rights are pushed aside when culture becomes the focus. So, you know, not all the criticisms have come uh, from the right. Okay, so I want to transition to something more modern. Now, I don't know how much you know about this, so let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Arizona is a state that, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, has a large number of ethnic minorities, particularly Mexican-Americans. Um, Governor Jan Brewer passed that law a few years ago that uh, allowed Arizona law enforcement officers to demand the ID and, I believe, detain anyone they believe was a, uh, an, an illegal immigrant. And so, you know, this is a state that struggled with its multicultural identity. So in 2010, Arizona passed a law that prohibits a school district or a charter school from including in its program of instruction any course or classes that, one, promote the overthrow of the federal or state government or the Constitution, two, promotes resentment towards any race or class, okay, three, advocates ethnic solidarity instead of being individuals, and four, are designed 
for a certain ethnicity. Okay, and so the superintendent of instruction for the state of Arizona, a man named Tom Horn, who's now the attorney general in Arizona, uh, was adamant that the Mexican-American Studies Program at the Tucson Unified School District was in violation of the law. So he performed an audit of the program, uh, an independent audit. And the auditors of the program found that actually it was in complete compliance with the law. But a judge, and judges in Arizona, as they are elsewhere, are, are elected, ignored the audit and ignored the evidence and backed the superintendent's claim and ruled that the district was out of compliance in December of 2011. So in January of 2012, the Tucson Unified School District voted to end the Mexican-American Studies Program. Now what's interesting is the African-American Studies Program continued. Um, I believe there was also a Latino Studies Program. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but, uh, but the Mexican-American Studies Program was the only of the ethnic studies that was, that was banned. They also banned a number of books. Um, they banned Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and that book is a, a far-left Marxist uh, thought on education. Bill Bigelow's Rethinking Columbus, which is a, a reinterpretation of Columbus based on Columbus's crimes rather than his victories. And then, curiously, Shakespeare's The Tempest. Um, there was intense community backlash. Okay, supporters of the program argued that while 40%, 48% of Hispanic students nationwide drop out, in Tucson Unified School District's program, 93% of those students who were Hispanic graduated, and 85% went, went on to college. Okay? And since only the Mexican-American uh, studies program was banned, they saw it as a clear attack on the Hispanic population. And what I want to do is show you a clip from a documentary about uh, this particular issue. I'm hoping it works. If it doesn't, you can follow the link um, there on the PowerPoint that you've downloaded. And this is clip three. When I was in high school in 1963, I participated in the March on Washington where Martin Luther King said he wanted his son to be judged by the quality of his character and not the color of his skin. And I'm still fighting for that now against what I believe to be something that is very wrong, which is dividing students up by ethnicity and treating them separately by ethnicity. All right. yeah. All right. yeah. I'm calling on Tucson Unified School District to shut down the ethnic studies program and start teaching kids to treat each other as individuals and not on the basis of what race they were born into. And the chanting behind us, I think, illustrates the rudeness that they teach to their kids. With ethnic studies, there's a desire to develop ethnic uh, solidarity. Uh, you know, this group, we're, we're the... Where are the Latinos, that other group, they're the African Americans, that other group, they're the Asian Americans, the other group, they're the Anglos, and so on. In the human being, there is, uh, there is a primitive part that is tribal. And that will say, you know, I want to be with members of my own tribe, members of my own race, and that sort of thing. And the, whole, the function of civilization and the function of our public school system is to get people to transcend that. And there are better ways to get students to perform academically and to want to go into college than to try to infuse them with racial ideas. So do you think they're, you don't think they're doing anything right then? I really don't. I know. I think they should be abolished. Hey, hey, y'all, let's get it. Let's get the room into it. Let's talk on, please. Shine light on the cockroaches and watch them scatter. La Raza, the race studies, teaching Tucson students to hate America. What a great use of our tax dollars. I pay taxes to TUSD and I am outraged. In the light that we're in, this political light, we are accused ironically, of being racist. And that's the total antithesis of what we believe. Do we talk about race in this class? Yes. Do we talk about class? Yes. Do we talk about sexism? Yes. We talk about all systems of oppression, but that doesn't necessarily make us sexist, does it? Or, or classes, but they like to throw racist at us. Most people haven't taken ethnic studies themselves. So when I hear people talk about what's wrong with ethnic studies, it's usually on the basis of not knowing very much about it on a first-hand level. When you hear that your vote doesn't count, it does. Kind of. No. There's no kind of. All right? And I will put that to rest. And I'm not telling you that because I'm a government teacher and I'm supposed to tell you that. I'm telling you because it's the truth. What the curriculum is actually trying to do is to show young people how they can become engaged in a participatory democracy. What was our first constitution called? Articles of Confederation. Okay, good. Articles of Confederation. All right? Y'all should know that. If you don't know that, write that down. 
Okay, so um, that gives you two perspectives on, uh, on this particular conflict, the perspective of Tom Horn and the perspective, or at least a look at uh, one of these, these courses in the Mexican-American Studies program. Now here's two quotes. Uh, one is from Myra Feliciano, a Mexican-American student who was in the program. She said, we live in a state where there's a lot of history, Mexican history, and they're trying to do away with it, like if it's going to go away. We're not worth as much as a white student in a class where they could learn their history. We can't learn our history and our culture. Another quote from Tom Horn. The job of the public schools is to develop the students' identity as Americans and as strong individuals. It is not the job of public schools to promote ethnic chauvinism. The program divides kids up by race. They're the Bull Connors because they're resegregating. We are the ones standing up for civil rights. And Bull Connor is a reference to the sheriff of, I believe, Selma. And who was famous for sicking the police dogs and fire hydrants and fire hoses, excuse me, on uh, those who were peacefully marching with Martin Luther King from Montgomery to Selma. Okay, and uh, so I, I've posted a, a couple prompts on the discussion board regarding this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, of course, this highlights the idea that multicultural education is something we still struggle with. It's a, a particular flashpoint in Arizona, because if you, if you don't know your American history, Arizona was at one point part of Mexico up until 1848, which in the grand scheme of things is fairly recently. So a lot of the population there that has been there for generations identifies as Mexican-American. Um, but the dominant school textbooks, especially in social studies, tend to come from a European perspective, and that's, that's the case in most places. Okay, so go ahead over there, uh, take a look at that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the program and, and uh, your perspectives on, on what you've seen.